you to rethink your civic connection. I want you to change the way you're thinking about the people that you know that you're sitting next to, about the person who's in the back of the room that you actually don't know, about the people who are in Atlanta, Azerbaijan, and Athens, and those that are in the mayor's office, the state capitol, and Washington, D.C., because you actually have a direct connection to all of those people, and I don't think you thought about it. I didn't always really care much about civic connections. I'm from a small town in Arkansas, fourth generation, and I couldn't wait to get out. I had no anonymity. I couldn't go anywhere without knowing maybe everyone that was there. <laughs> and that meant that my business was their business. And it meant that if I was dressing a little too punk or I was driving too fast or my grades weren't good enough or they didn't like who I was dating, they not only told me, but they told my parents, my grandparents, and anyone else who might listen. I couldn't wait to get out. I also couldn't wait for my mother to quit schlepping me around town to all of her community events. <laughs> 1983. I'm a teenager, I just wanted to, you know, listen to punk music. She was a quorum court justice of the peace. She was on the utilities commission. And let me tell you, in a small rural town that has uh, chicken coops as its primary industry, there, we all needed to be concerned about that water. She was on that commission. She was head of the United Way campaign. She served in the Chamber of Commerce, concerned about economic development for that area. She was the treasurer of our church for over 20 years. And she also did a range of other things while working full time as a single mother. And she wasn't the only one. My paternal grandfather was an election monitor for over 60 years. My grandmothers, my grandpas, they would say that they were just gossiping on the phone. But every day they would call the widow women or those that were sick in the community on a regular schedule to see how they were. What was this about? This was about connection. This was about civic connections. This is the glue of our communities and it's what makes democracy work. I didn't know that I would grow up and be committed to civic engagement. But I moved to the big city, moved to St. Louis for graduate school. I haven't left yet. And what I found was people could easily avoid the private connection that had public consequence. That they would rely on experts, rules, abstractions, someone else to take care of it. And I began to hold up that rearview mirror and see the value of what I had experienced growing up. I then decided to commit my life to studying civic engagement. So I'm going to frame this from a social scientist kind of perspective and share with you the status of civic engagement and why you each need to rethink your connection and what you're doing to those numbers. Because you need to rethink how you're connected to caring for those that you know and you don't know, how you are giving your time and your treasure to many causes, and how you're engaging in our political life. And I give I give you those questions to consider, those areas to consider, because I have embraced the word civic. Civic in its root Latin phrase means public. And it's understanding that even the behaviors that we may engage in in a private arena can have very public consequences. I use the word engagement specifically instead of participation because this connotes that you are connected to the activity. You are connected to the people in whom you're engaging with. You're not just participating within a structure. You're bringing your time, your talent, your treasure to the moment. And you can do it in lots of different ways. Within the social arena, we tend to think about volunteerism, community level activities and events. We think about philanthropy. On the political side, we tend to think about that that, that makes our uh, democracy run, that brings the voice of the people to to the, uh, those that, that uh, are responsible for our governance. These activities have a, a character about them that are about humanitarianism, how we care for one another, that we are actually responsible for one another, not those abstractions, rules, or experts. And it's important 
that we think about why this matters. And as a body of research, research is really only now coming to bear. We had from the mid-1800s Alexis de Tocqueville's research as he traveled across America and looked at those rural communities and examined that glue. But only recently have we begun to look at the impact of civic engagement at the individual, the social, and the societal level. At the individual level, the research that I've done with my colleagues here at Washington University has found that you are happier, you are healthier, and you live longer the more engaged you are. We've also found by using national population data that through the recession, those individuals that were volunteering and lost their job got another job faster than those that didn't. Common sense, right? But think about the personal benefits that you can reap from this. The social benefits are huge. You can think of any number of the disasters that have hit the United States in the last 10 years, and it's people willing to walk out and help those around them. This, the ability to mobilize action in that way helps people survive. At the political level, it's, it's uh, particularly disturbing um, the disengagement that we're seeing, and I'm going to walk through that in a little bit. But if we think about the United States and our democratic system being set up, and, and it has its rules of law and its procedures, but the only people that are participating in that are those that are career politicians or civil servants. Where's the voice of the people in that process? And so then in a political consequence kind of way, do we really have democracy? So I'm going to start with social connectedness. There's a range of data that shows that uh, we would just prefer to be anonymous. We would like some anonymity, that we shirk from our connections to other people. So having grown up in the South, I was always taught that at the dinner table, you don't discuss religion and you don't discuss politics. You want to keep it civil, right? What we're finding from research is that these children that are in this photo, they're less likely than to grow up and care about social issues or be involved in politics. That in a private way, those private actions that lack of desire to engage with those around you about the critical issues that impact us all has a consequence that will span through time. We also are not showing up to share our voice with others. 9% of the United States population in 2012, according to census data, showed up to share their opinion at a public meeting. So when you're concerned about how your neighborhood's going to be developed or where street lights are going to be put and you don't show up to share your voice and those rules or abstractions or experts make the decisions for you, who's to blame? Favors with neighbors. Anybody shared a cup of sugar with your neighbor lately? Do you even know your neighbor's name? Crime. I'll give this as an example of a neighborhood problem. There's some very simple solutions to crime in neighborhoods. You lock your cars on your doors, and you turn your porch lights on. But a lot of people don't think about that. And so if there's a rash of crime where you have people breaking into homes or cars within neighborhoods, there's really simple things that you as a neighborhood in mass can do to change that. But we're not doing it. 8% had worked to address a problem in 2012. Philanthropy and volunteerism, thinking about this as another area of civic activity. Donations are essential for running the nonprofit sector. Our nonprofit sector is our front line for arts and culture, for our health care, for social services. And it is dependent on you willing to pay for the experts that do need to be in the positions to deliver those goods. Yet 51% do that. And what's disturbing about that particular statistic is when you drill down, those that give the most money are the ones that have the least as a proportion of their income. The other piece is that when you ask people why they didn't contribute, they say, well, my paltry amount won't make a difference. We can all do addition here, right? Paltry amounts add up to something big. 
The nonprofit sector depends on volunteers in multiple ways. I think we tend to think about the grandmother who's stuffing envelopes at the front desk. But there's a wider range of activity that can happen within organizations that is delivering the programs, working alongside those professionals, while also serving on the boards. Many people think that it's the executive director that runs the show. That executive director reports to a board of directors that is made up of volunteers. The legal code in this country requires that. And yet what we're finding is, and this relates to the next statistic, that those that do volunteer only volunteer about 32 hours a year. Any of, anyone who served on a board knows it takes more time than that. We have a fraying of the civic fabric where we cannot run civil society. We do not have people stepping up to serve in these kind of leadership roles um, in, in a voluntary way. And when we look across donations, who volunteers, and how much time they contribute, it is predominantly through faith-based organizations, through your synagogue, your church, your mosque. So what about those arts and culture organizations? We all like to go to the museum. What about the zoo? What about those social issues, those health issues that may impact you or your family members at any given time? Who's there to provide that support, both in time and in treasure? We also see in political engagement that over time, and particularly with younger generations, volunteerism is seen as a substitute for political action. If we think about the college students of today, they lived through 9-11, they've lived through Hurricane Katrina, and they don't have faith in their government to act for them. And so they've turned to that voluntary sector to engage. But if we're not engaging politically, then there are consequences for how resources are distributed and how our polity will function. If the United States is put forth as the primary democracy upon which other countries base their political system, we're in trouble as a planet. 74% of eligible voters are registered, and of that, in the 2012 election, 62% of them voted. Midterm elections, you're lucky if you get 40%, and at local elections, you're lucky if you get 20. Within this, the political machine itself is disturbing. When you look at who donates, it is the wealthiest, and we have new structures for how the, those monies can be contributed and donated. Super PACs allow for that attribution and that money to be hidden in many ways. It becomes a machine that's not accessible and that's not invested in across the populace. We also have a disturbing trend where, and I can think back to my grandmothers and sitting on the phone, they had no trouble calling up City Hall if the street light was out or there was some other problem, the trash didn't come on time. But we're not doing that now. We've disengaged from that. Now, that's one example at a local level. When you think about our state and, and national governments, they depend on citizen voice around the policies and issues that they're trying to work on. Every, it's just like every vote counts, right? Ask Al Gore. Every vote counts. So does every call, <laughs> every reach out to a, a government official. And then this final example that I give is around attending a march, a rally, or a protest. I dare say that very few of you have done that. And we put that in the landscape of our democratic system. That's the disruption. That's what causes the major change. So who's standing up? Whose voice is represented? And how are we bringing that voice forward? I want to leave you all with some ideas on how you can rethink your civic connection. Put your phone away. So the Gephardt Institute at Washington University runs a, a civic leadership program called Civic Scholars. I was so pleased that one of the outcomes of our first cohort, I talked to them, shared some of these data. They talked about it with their instructors afterwards, and they said, you know, I'm going to pull my earbuds out of my ear while I walk across campus. I'm going to leave my phone in my pocket. I'm not going to check Facebook. Heck, I'm going to close my Facebook page down. That's a little extreme. <laughs> but the idea being that 
they realized they were missing the opportunity to connect with people that they knew and didn't know. They were closing themselves for, uh, from opportunities to have connections that could be leveraged for themselves, for those that they're interacting with, and for the greater good. So I think particularly for this generation, but many of us, we've developed habits that are actually getting in the way of the true habits of democracy. The daily news. I'm telling you, that tweet is not the daily news. How many of you have actually read an entire article in the New York Times Magazine? Have you had enough patience to really read the journalism, to start at the beginning and go all the way through? Journalism is at a crisis. Our ability to pay attention and to fully understand the complex social, economic, and political issues that are facing us are escaping us because we're not committing to do the research. We're taking the soundbite as fact. We're oversimplifying. And then we take that oversimplification and we pair it with our lack of civic knowledge and we're not acting. I love Schoolhouse Rock. Bill, he taught me a lot. But the problem is, today's generation doesn't know about Bill. We don't have a national media campaign to increase civic education and civic liter literacy. I, I run one of the most incredible social work programs in the world galaxy. Yes. Those students are the brightest in the world. We have had to change our introductory course on social welfare policy because they don't know how a bill becomes law. If they don't know how a bill becomes law, how are they going to take the knowledge that they've gained and do something about it? So I'm going to say something provocative here, or at least I hope it is. There is an overemphasis on innovation. There's an overemphasis on the next big idea that's going to make the most difference. Instead of encouraging our young people to just come up with the next big solution, we should encourage them to join the solutions that are already underway. There are proven strategies, evidence-based practices around how to address hunger and homelessness, economic development, international development, and yet we're looking for that next big idea, and we're not getting behind the ones that actually work. So I encourage us, join, just join. Join someone else who has a really good idea. And then when you join, ask others to do it with you. The number one predictor of volunteerism in philanthropy? Someone asked me. It's really that simple. And it's really up to every one of us to understand that when we don't perform in these arena, that there are consequences not only for ourselves, but to those we know and to those that we don't. I hope that you rethink your civic connection and stand up for us all. Thank you.